Ten years ago, Fusion had one rule. Build it huge. Make the plasma chamber gigantic, and the superheated gas is easier to confine. That mindset gave us ITER. A project so big, its main platform covers the area of about 60 soccer fields. Then, MIT asked a sharper question. What if you do not grow the machine at all? What if you shrink it and use magnets so strong that the plasma still behaves? Their reactor, Spark, is room scale compared with ITER, yet it targets net energy. If it works, fusion stops feeling forever, and the gamble starts right now. Why size used to matter? Fusion sounds easy when you say it fast. Take two light atoms, usually hydrogen, and push them together until they merge. When they fuse, a little mass becomes a lot of energy. The sun does this all day, which makes the dream feel simple. But the sun has a cheat code, gravity. It squeezes fuel under insane pressure because it is enormous. On Earth, we cannot do that, so we use heat. A fusion plasma must reach around 100 million degrees Celsius, so we never let it touch the walls. We suspend it with magnetic fields like an invisible cage. This is where bigger is easier came from. The Lawson criterion says you need the right mix of temperature, density, and confinement time. If confinement time is short, you must push temperature and density harder. Big tokamaks give you more volume and more time, so the plasma has a better chance to stay stable. That logic helped justify ITER, the giant international reactor being assembled in southern France. The hope is net energy, where fusion output beats the energy used to sustain the plasma. Quick sponsor break. Search your name and city, and you might find your address or phone number on sites you never used. That data is collected and sold. Incogni helps remove personal details by requesting takedowns from data brokers. With the unlimited plan, you can submit custom links, including White Page and Trellis. Law or Unicort and their team handle the removals. Use code MEGAPROJECTS for 60% off an annual plan. Now, back to Fusion. A long history of 30 years away. Fusion research did not start with ITER. It started with bold machines and hard lessons. In the 1950s, Z-pinch devices tried to squeeze plasma using electric currents. They looked dramatic, but the plasma would twist, kink, and escape. Instability won. In the 1960s, the Soviet tokamak arrived and changed the field. A donut-shaped chamber, plus carefully shaped magnetic fields, gave the plasma a smoother path. Suddenly, confinement times improved enough that the science felt real. By the 1970s, optimism was everywhere. Many believed practical fusion power was only a few decades away. Then, the decades passed. In the 1990s, it was still 30 years away. In the 2010 S, the same story. It became a running joke, but the joke had teeth. Every step forward revealed a new problem. Holding plasma steady for seconds was a win. Making it self-heating and steady for long periods was the challenge. And the bigger these machines got, the slower the cycle became. A small experimental device can be changed, rebuilt, and tested again. A mega project cannot. When you pour billions into a single design, you stop iterating fast. You spend years proving every part is perfect before you even switch it on. So fusion drifted into a pattern of giant plans and long schedules, with cost and complexity rising together. That is why the question from MIT mattered so much. Instead of asking how huge a reactor must be, they asked what would happen if you made the magnets stronger and the machine smaller. It sounds like a shortcut, like building a jet engine out of a hairdryer. But in fusion, magnet strength is not decoration. It is the steering wheel, magnets that change the math. Traditional tokamak magnets are superconductors, but they are picky. They must be cooled with liquid helium to about 4 Kelvin, and their practical field strength tops out near 11 or 12 Tesla. That limit mattered because confinement gets dramatically better as the magnetic field rises. A common scaling says energy confinement improves roughly with the fourth power of the magnetic field. So if you double the field, you can get up to 16 times the confinement performance. That is not a small gain. It is a size-changing gain. The new ingredient is a class of high-temperature superconductors, especially rare-earth barium copper oxide, usually called REBCO. 
Instead of being fragile wire, it comes as tape that can carry massive current without electrical resistance. It also works at higher operating temperatures, around 20 Kelvin in many designs, which simplifies cooling compared with four Kelvin systems. Most importantly, Rebco can reach fields above 20 Tesla when engineered correctly. MIT's Plasma Science and Fusion Center teamed up with a spin-off company, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, to push that magnet technology fast. Their idea was not new plasma physics, it was a new engineering lever. Keep the tokamak concept, but shrink the machine by raising the field. Smaller machines can be built faster, tested sooner, and improved more often. Instead of waiting for a single global machine to answer everything, you build a tight prototype, learn, and build the next one. This approach is why Spark became the name to watch. If the magnets can do what the models say, a compact reactor can chase the same fusion goals as a giant one, but on a schedule and budget that looks more like modern engineering, and less like a multi-generation monument. The day the coil hit 20 Tesla. A claim like, we can shrink fusion, needed a public measurable proof. That proof came on September 5th, 2021, inside a lab on Albany Street in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The team had spent years turning Rebco tape into a real coil that could survive extreme forces. In these fields, the fight is not only against the heat, it is against stress. Magnetic pressure tries to tear the coil apart, like a giant hand prying it open. On test day, engineers raised the current step by step, Sensors watched temperature, voltage, vibration, and anything that hinted at instability. If the coil quenched, it would stop being superconducting, heat up fast, and risk damage. Then the readout crossed the line, 20 Tesla. It was a record for a fusion-relevant high-temperature superconducting magnet, and it held the field without quenching. Dennis White, a leader of the MIT effort, later said the moment felt like the future shifting. Whether you love the quote or not, the result did shift the conversation. Investors noticed immediately. Within months, Commonwealth Fusion Systems reported raising over $1.8 billion in funding, with backing tied to names like Bill Gates, Google, and major energy firms. Even people who dislike private sector fusion admitted this magnet was real progress, not hype. There was also a cultural lesson. The group moved like a hybrid of a university lab and a startup engineering team. They built hardware, tested it, fixed it, and repeated. Less waiting for international votes, more learning by doing. That speed matters because fusion is full of surprises, and surprises punish slow programs. Spark, Arc, and the roadblocks. Spark, often said as Spark, is still a tokamak, but it is a different philosophy. The name is often expanded as smallest possible affordable robust compact. It aims to be the smallest machine that can plausibly reach net energy. Its central chamber stands only about 3 meters tall, with a plasma radius of around 1.85 meters. It is built to fit in an industrial building, not dominate a landscape. The planned magnet set uses 18 high temperature superconducting coils made from Rebco tape. They are designed to generate fields above 20 Tesla, roughly twice ITER's field. The magnets are modular, so a coil can be removed and replaced without dismantling everything. The target performance is a fusion gain factor, Q greater than 1, and the design goal is Q10. For context, the Jet Tokamak in the UK achieved about Q equals 0 0.67, and ITER also aims for Q10, but not until the mid-2030s. Spark's schedule has been far more aggressive. Construction began in 2023 in Devons, Massachusetts. Plans have pointed to assembly around 2025, first plasma around 2026, and net energy level tests after that. Cost is part of the pitch too. ITER's total price is often described as north of $50 billion, while Spark's program has been framed as under $3 billion, largely private. But compact does not mean easy. Stability margins shrink. A small wobble can end a pulse. Neutrons from deuterium-tritium fusion can damage metals and may degrade superconductors over time. Heat exhaust is brutal. The diverter must handle heat fluxes higher than rocket hardware, and Spark's power density makes that tougher. 
Tritium supply is limited and decays with a half-life of just over 12 years, so any real industry needs breeding blankets to make more. Even regulation is a new territory, with work underway with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to define licensing paths. Yet even an imperfect spark run would matter. If high field, compact confinement behaves as predicted, the whole field pivots. If it fails, it still teaches engineers exactly what to fix for RC and whatever comes after. Fusion has always been a fight between elegant equations and stubborn hardware. For decades, the safest plan was to scale up and hope the plasma stayed calm long enough. Spark flips that logic. It is believed that stronger magnets can buy the same confinement in a smaller, faster, cheaper machine. The bet might fail, and the obstacles are real. Heat, neutrons, fuel, and control. But it is a bet that gets tested soon, not in 30 years. If the cage holds, the fusion story turns from promise to progress. And if it doesn't, the lessons still push every reactor that follows.